Okay. So, uh, update on the promise here. Just let us you know, uh, we are currently at the Motel 6. Paid up until tomorrow. After that, it's going to get a little hairy, I think, depending on how soon Goodyear can get uh, an evaluation done on the van and find out exactly what's wrong with it. And in the short term, probably it's okay. That's nice. I'm going to have to tow it right back to the spot where we had it more or less and camp out another couple of days. It's going to require a little more fundraising on our part to get actually things actually done. But we're making progress here. And things are crawling along, and at the very least, we'll find out exactly what is wrong with the van instead of guesswork. And say, well, it could be that, it could be that. And like the Nissan guy said on the thing, we could go like six different roads and still not find it. But we will know where we have to go from there, and then start planning and get our happy butts out to Virginia, hopefully. And even better if we find out our little business idea comes through. On Monday, and we get the funding for that. And then the whole lot of us can tell the rest of the world to go screw themselves. We're in business for ourselves. No. No less is melting. So that brings us to just the whole point of this particular video. It's something I alluded to before. Namely, why am I doing this in the first place? Kind of prompted by uh, something similar that Pit Trekkie did a few weeks back. Kind of why is he doing this channel? This channel, and, and since I apparently shit, do that later. Okay, since apparently I gave him the idea of doing a channel in the first place, I figured it's only fair. <clears throat> kind of give him a little shout out of you know why I'm doing it. Kind of a response, but maybe the world will follow. So it's like, why am I doing this channel? What am I trying to accomplish? And for that matter, why the name of Captain April in the first place? Because it's not something I just came up with, you know, fairly on the thing. I had the name Captain April in various performances. I think going back to, I think, was it Prodigy? I think it was the first one? The pre AOL days, or just before, early pre AOL. But going back to that period, you know, mid 90s or so, early. And kind of why I settled on that name. Well, just because, you know, share the first name of Robert, okay? Doing, someone says Bob, you know, Bobby. Yeah. No. To me, Captain April kind of represents the core foundations of Star Trek, the very foundation, the, the underpinnings of where it all started. And it serves as a bit of a touchdown, touchstone to those founding principles and how well or how poorly the current incarnations of Star Trek are holding to those principles. And I'm including fan productions in that, too, and other stuff like the Orville. You see, how well are they carrying the torch forward as opposed to the official job, you know, the official ones? And who's doing the better job of it? And I'll say that to the top of another time, because this is the third time I've tried this thing, and I've rambled every single time. But a large part of this, probably my, my own personal background as a fan, because, you know, I was two and a half when Star Trek premiered in 1966, September. And I watched it on NBC right alongside my dad. He was at, you watch it, and I'm two and a half. I'm sitting there right next to him watching this too. So I'm being inculcated, you know, from toddlerhood. And so I can kind of lay claim to being an original series fan from the original first days and, you know, on NBC. And it's like when, uh, you know, I had no first moment of discovery, pun unintended, of, of finding Star Trek. I, it's always been there. It's been like Santa and Mickey Mouse and all that. They just do it. You know, and one of the Sears in the Twilight Department series and seeing that Enterprise model and getting it. I didn't have to, what's that? And, oh, that's the Enterprise. Give me. You know? So, and when the animated series came along in 73, I already knew it was there. I knew there was a live action show before that. No one had to explain it to me. I knew that, was, I knew that wasn't the original Star Trek. It was a close second. It was a quick follow-up, but it wasn't the original. And think by that, it's like, there had been reruns at that point. But it had been very sporadic. I think usually like Channel 9 would occasionally run one on a Saturday afternoon and I'd catch it during, you know, channel surfing. Which at that point would turn on the dial and come across usually like halfway through the episode at least. Usually more than that. So those earliest memories of the episodes are very fractured. <laughs> I can piece them into where they are now, but I, you know, I know which episodes they came from. But back then I was like, oh, that's weird. <laughs> it's like, you know, and there's little gaps here because I wasn't really paying attention to what was going on. It's like, oh, pretty... 
but you know, it really, you know, wasn't until like seventy four, seventy five when they really started running them for for sure. You know, and on weekday afternoons, so it's, you know, locally here, them in Channel Four at four o'clock just before the news. And then it gets okay. Now I can pay attention and watch it and find out what's going on. Because you know, I've been reading about it mostly to that point, and like the making of Star Trek, the world of Star Trek, and a little show, a little book called Star Trek Lives, which kind of gave me uh, insight into the fan side of whole things, which kind of you know the background and all that, and also a little something called the Star Trek Well Committee. That was that was a good organization back then. It's Shirley, Shirley Miuski and others, you know, where, where fans could write in and connect with other fans. So, I mean, in North Glen, I think. I was dying was pretty much it. <laughs> so I guess for I mean, I, I turns out I would kind of you know give an idea to the other people that come fans. I was that was a touchdown for them in some ways of Star Trek. But you know, like Roddenberry was saying Star Trek fans are born with a typewriter in one hand and a roll of stamps in the other. And I jumped on that and I, I wrote letters here and there. I remained at the Well Committee and I think probably a few to Paramount. But anybody, anybody else remembers the Star Trek Well Committee? Yes, congratulations, you're old. And the first convention experience, there was a little something in the fall of 76. It was celebrating the 10th anniversary of Star Trek and the 8th anniversary of the North Gun Mall itself. And they basically put on a Star Trek convention. And this and in 76, this is still one of the early ones. And it was the entire mall. It was an indoor mall. You know, you had uh, Sears at one end, J.C. Penney at the other. There was a Woolworths halfway through. There was a... The Denver, which became made in heaven, and then this local thing, but but the entire length of the mall was basically one big long Star Trek convention. You had dealers and art con, you know, art displays and model contests, and something that just came up. Uh, somebody actually took some footage of this thing with a Super 8 camera, doing like a news report, and the, the reporter is you know typically clueless of what's going on. <laughs> And I looked. I'm not in there anywhere. And I don't remember Leonard Nimoy being on this. And Jimmy Doohan, I remember distinctly. Because I was down there when he did his thing. But I don't remember Nimoy being you know, advertised at all. But maybe he was. I think they held this over the weekend. So he may have been there like one day and we came the next. And Jimmy was there both days. Remember, he, he had you know, go go team beer. I'll be, I'll be a link, there'll be a link in the video. You know, at the bottom for the, to that particular video. But I remember the one point. He was like, you know, talking about the movie coming up. You know, they're having, and, and some ganked them girl in the audience. Can you do that? Oh, can I do your accent? Do my accent for you? And he kicked into that room, and then the crowd went nuts. And they had a big ten foot long paper mache model of the Enterprise suspended from the ceiling. <laughs> and yeah, that's in that video. You can look at it. And it was going there. That's when I first, you know, well, see, you know, this is what a convention is like. I read a thing about it. But okay, we got this place. I managed to get my first list of all the episodes. And. Something I recopied over and over again over the years. And various things and saw different you know, people taking models of it. First time I'd seen one been mangled as the end of the constellations. And even back then, yes, folks were overdoing the damage on the constellation. But yeah, that was that was fun. I gave them a little teaser for what to expect when I started going to you know actual conventions a few years later, mainly Starcon Denver, which later became Star. That's an interesting history there. Some can chime in. But yeah, for a long time, it was Star Starcon Denver. Starting like, I'd missed like the first couple of them. David Gerald, David, Dorothy Fontana, and Samuel Adams was supposed to be on here. You know, Stanley Adams. You know, Samuel, he was supposed to be on here, but he had the, what one of the staffs had the you know, the bad form to die beforehand. So now we didn't expect it. It's kind of funny to think of it in those terms. But he was scheduled, and he died just before he had to come out here. So. But yeah, I missed that one. That was at the Regency. That would have been, the Regency was a fun place for conventions. You had the big ballroom and the dome in front. The ones I mainly went to was out of the one hotel up by Stapleton. It was various, various uses of the stick. The, it was various times the Stouffer's, the Clarion. I think it's now Red Mine or something. Or the Double Tree. But that was a fun place too. But that was a long time going to those things. You know, the only real interruptions when you joined the Air Force. But yeah. I got my bona fides going back a ways in the fan thing. So, and nowadays, look, I'm kind of basically living the dream here. I'm working with B. Joe Trimble on the new Concordance. 
And I'm not in, in the more in depth than just contributing pic, contributing uh, pictures. Now I'm actually helping piece through files and redo the redo the coding for the episode the previous coding. I've had pretty good exchanges with various folks connected directly with the work on the shows from David Gerald to Mike Okuda, Doug Drexler, Rick Starbuck, Randy Probert, a few others. And as such, in the, in the experience, I feel I do have a responsibility to hold the, the current franchise to account when they screw it up or when they get it right and provide some context on the whole thing. Because there is an element of like Galactica, what has happened before will happen again. And there's a lot of, you know, cycle repeating here in some ways. But there's also other ones where because people say, you know, no, it did the same thing with Next Gen and with the movies. Not quite the same way. This is different. And I can say that because I've been through a lot of the other stuff, and this is a different situation than it was back when they first announced uh, Next Generation when they first doing the movies. And I and I was one of the guys who was ticked off about the design of the ship too, in, in motion picture. That's why you had that big five minute flyby of the ship to sell over old farts like me. And I was I was only twelve years old at the time, <laughs> thirteen years old when they began moving in, and I was already screaming about the ship. But that was the one over guys like me who were irritated about the change of the ship, but. You know, so you feel, oh, it's just taking so long. One, you need to see it in the big screen, too. That was back when you went to a movie, you went to a movie and at the theater. Unless you got like a 60-inch screen, you don't get the same thing. you got to be in a big theater with a few hundred other fellow idiots watching this thing unfold to really get the point of that scene. But yeah, that's why, you know, and I want to bring that experience in here and provide some context in here, so... Because a lot of the commentators I've seen so far, they weren't around in the old days. They don't have this length of experience with the, with the show and the fans and the various permutations of what's going on. So I want to point out, you know, because a lot of them have come on with, with Next Gen and Voyager, and God, God bless you for that. But yeah, I was in the background there from the beginning. Even though it was like two and a half, I, I was there and I was soaking it in. And I made a study of, you know, the production of the show and the writing and the, and the personalities involved. And I think I do get a decent idea of where Roddenberry's head was at at various times. Because usually when I brought you know, out a thing about, you know, what he was probably thinking, people who actually knew him said, yeah, that's probably about right. <laughs> that sounds about like him. So, yeah, okay, I think i, I got to break a handle here. So, yeah, I, that's what I mean when I want to be the Rush Limbaugh of Star Trek. I want to be the big voice on the sidelines you know, calling yay or nay or whatever comes down the pike with a Star Trek label and saying whether or not it's worthy to carry that label or not. And if it's not, what is? You know. And that, that and again, it's more than just the shows, also the various products. Now, is this a decent product put out here that should be Star Trek? Or this should, is this crap? You know. And we can go back to the early 70s with the deal of disc shooter guns and the which are already in production before Star Trek. And someone say, hey, let's, uh, let's call them Star Trek tracer guns and really make a mint, you know. So yeah, merchandising is also the thing I want to look at. But that's pretty much what I want to do here. That's what I'm hoping to accomplish with this channel. And what I hope you can also help us accomplish with this channel, but not allowing us to go under, keep us housed and fed and alive, and be able to actually make a living at this. Because one thing my dad said is, if you can make some money doing the, with the Star Trek stuff, you do okay. You know, it was one of the few things where it didn't turn into a big argument, you know, about philosophy or theology or whatever. Because, you know, I, if I'd known I was watching him as, watching the show as a toddler, I'd say, hey, you started this. <laughs> Blame yourself for this. But I like to think he's looking down. He's like, yep, okay, now you're getting somewhere. But that's where we're at. That's what I want to accomplish here, and that's why I'm in there. Because occasionally I still get someone, because there was a... Uh, I think it was a Trek Yards board I was commenting on. Or maybe it was Irish Trek Yards, but, you know, talking about whatever discovery come along about it, they're writing Starfleet as idiots. But, uh, there's certain things, you know, and one guy started chiding me, you're just an ignorant female, so, you know, like, one, I'm a guy, <laughs> two, I'm a veteran, and I know a few things about it. you don't do that sort of thing. You know, there's a the bit about... Six months later, the Shinzu still sitting out there, largely intact, and the Klingons, you know, one, the Starfleet was morons for leaving it there, and two, the Klingons were morons for not touching it for six months. And I had to slap him down a little bit, like, no. <laughs> and then to come back, well, why are they Captain April? It's like, learn yourself some history here. First Captain of the Enterprise, Robert April, look up. 
So that kind of also why I'm doing this video for people who really haven't kept up with their Star Trek history. Hopefully, that is one thing that Discovery finally they they officially canonized the name Captain Robert April. Yeah. They had it on screen, although even that was geez, Baltic only five names. I make sure it's names that people recognize. No, 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 people. It's another, you know the way that those put together also an indication they have no clue what they're doing. But that's about it, really. And. PayPal, Patreon down below. We uh, more immediate needs. If we're gonna get another night here, you know, stretches out to s through Sunday, we really need about another seventy bucks because weekend rates kick up. So if someone wants to be a hero on that one, it'd be appreciated. Otherwise, it's gonna be you know dragging all our stuff back up to uh, back up there on Fifty Eighth and camping out in the van a little longer. I mean, I really don't want to do that. Eh. So yeah, 70, 100 bucks here would help a lot right now, or just even just a few bucks, or at least we can, you know, keep fed or whatever and camp out in the van of the you know, park by Goodyear for a while, but either way, PayPal, Patreon down below, and again, I'm going to also include that link to that video, that, or that Super 8 camera Videos that someone did of that convention at the North Glen Mall. I didn't know they. It was while I was just double checking. Just, is there anything about that? You know, trying to get the actual date. And say, oh, there's footage. I wonder if I'm in it. <laughs> no, be nice if it was, but no. And it's also kind of cheese balls. Like I and I did a thing on that particular piece of footage. And yep, it's amazing how things have not changed. It, with conventions, you know, forty years later, it's still the same stuff. So, all right. So I'll catch you later.